It is the week of August 2nd, and welcome to episode 91 of Fault Lines, the National Security Institute's podcast that explores the disagreements between the political left and right on issues in national security and foreign policy. I'm Jamil Jaffer, NSI's founder and executive director. Today, we'll be doing a deep dive with Dr. Chris Ford on his recent paper, Principled Conservatism in America's Foreign Policy and National Security, published by the National Security Institute. Dr. Ford is currently a senior advisor for geopolitical policy and strategy at the MITRE Corporation, is a member of NSI's advisory board. In the past, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for WMD and Counterproliferation at the National Security Council, U.S. Special Rep for nu Nuclear Nonproliferation, a Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State on a variety of congressional committees, and as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve. Chris, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jamil. So Chris, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about this uh, NSI paper that you published about principled conservatism. So let's start right at the top. Where, what made you write a paper about principled conservatism in national security and foreign policy? I wanted to do what I could to try to, to you know, contribute to, or maybe catalyze if necessary, a conversation about how it is that, um, you know, my side of the aisle can uh, use this time that we have in the wilderness. Uh, you know, we. Uh, we're we're out of power uh, in every uh, every one of the political branches of government, but uh, there are a lot of us who've been around this town for a while. And you know, the traditional mode is that eventually, at some point, we will be back in the driver's seat. But I think it's time for us to, to spend some time thinking about what it is that we would do with that. How do we? we what, what is the intellectual capital? What are the the ideas and the thoughts and the agendas that we bring to? To that opportunity, if and when it comes around again. Yeah, you know, uh, Jake Sullivan, the uh, the new the current national security advisor for President Biden, uh, recently wrote. You know, prior to him joining the Biden administration, along with a number of his colleagues, wrote a paper about making foreign policy work for the middle class. And in a lot of ways, your paper feels like sort of the conservative version of of what does what does conservatism mean in foreign policy and national security. Um, and sort of, you know, sort of lays out a theory, at least one person's theory of, of what it means. So talk to us about at, at sort of at, at the top, at sort of an 80,000 foot level, uh, what are the core tenets of what you would describe as a principled conservative national security and foreign policy? Well, I try to approach this from, well, I guess to, 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 to back out a little bit, I mean, uh, one of my concerns was that the, uh, from the perspective of a you know, lifelong Republican who's been in Washington for a long time now, um, our, our party seems to, my party seems to be uh, very much at war with itself, but principally over issues that aren't so much uh, ones that have to do with foreign policy and national security. Uh, but it's not because we necessarily all agree on those things. It sort of feel, felt to me as if we just sort of really hadn't had the opportunity to think a lot about them because of preoccupations with all sorts of other internal valences and so forth. And at a time when the political process in general has become one in which, I mean, let, let's be fair, politics never quite stopped at the water's edge, but it was a right. nice, it was a nice thought. And there was at right. least some understanding that, you know, we have our own internal issues of right. whatever sort they may be. And then there's that world out there. And, and while we were never unified in dealing with it, um, I think we're, we were in some danger of being spectacularly disunified at a time when when that's a really dangerous and bad idea. Not that it was ever that good, but it's yeah, especially so, challenging now. Right. So we have these so we have these debates in America that are taking place over foreign policy and national security. And they're and they're they're pretty fraught and they're 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 taking place in this very, I think it's fair to say toxic political environment that has been for at least a few years. And um and, and, and as you point out, there are these debates within the conservative movement, as there are, by the way, on the liberal side uh, amongst Democrats uh, about what uh, the right foreign policy and national security policy should be for, for our nation. Um, and we see Joe Biden actually dealing with that, right, with, on, on, the, on the question of Afghanistan, right, trying to figure out, you know, where do I go when it comes to Afghanistan? What do I do with these special immigrant visas, right? What do I do on a variety of issues? Um, even the border has huge national security consequences. Um, and, and, and has been an issue within the Biden administration. But talk to us about sort of on, you know, you wrote this paper about your side of the aisle, right? Our side of the aisle, right? I was, I was, I am a Republican. I was, uh, I thought I was a part of the, the mainstream Republican party, at least I was for a long time. Um, and now the mainstream of the Republican party appears to have moved away from where I am at least. Um, and so, so, but I have not left the Republican party like many have, uh, but, uh, but so talk to us about this fight that you see brewing within the Republican camp. And, and yes, it's true that, you know, we always talk about politics stopping the water's edge, but it's starting to spill over out there. And a lot of our allies and our adversaries are seeing 
the disagreements between Republicans and Democrats on one side, but also within the conservative movement about what it means to be, you know, are we isolationist? Are we are we leaning forward? So how do you see these sort of debates? And what does your papers tell us about, you know, what a principled conservative national security and foreign policy would look like? Well, what I was trying to do, and, and it was certainly not to lay down any kind of a, of a, of a dogma or doctrine here, but to, to try to jumpstart a conversation. This is just my tentative thought, and I yeah. you know, sort of hope this would be tossed out there for people to be engaging with and you know, uh, to, to, to make it part of an ongoing conversation. The hope being- Well, you and I can engage on it today. We can engage on it right here, well, right? how about that, right? Yeah, all right. Um, the, the hope being to to try to, to articulate a way to, to have a vision of what it means to be engaged in the world and to be a you know, strong, principled, engaged actor in the world, yeah. uh, so that it doesn't just come down to, a, I mean, there's a sort of stereotype of, uh, I mean, I think unfair to both parties, but there's a sort of a stereotype of the, the of camps within the Republican parties. It would suggest that it's some kind of a war between those who would sort of lurch mindlessly into trying to make the world exactly like us at bayonet point versus those who would pull back and hide their heads under whatever, you know, bag of sand is most yeah. conveniently available. And neither of those things is the case. And I think that there is and hope that there is room uh, for a type of engagement that is emphatic and driven and animated by uh, you know, American values, but isn't just a sort of, it's, it's neither the ostrich nor the sort of yeah. mindless crusader. And, and I try so to what articulate is, yeah. that by the What way. does that look like? Yeah, well, exactly. What does that look like? What is that, what is that sort of, where is that middle ground? I, mean, I think everyone, I don't think there's an American, Democrat or Republican alike, right, who would, would say I want America, you know, sort of living at the at the at the at the, you know, edge of a bay at the tip of a bayonet, right? Or or simply hiding from the world and hiding behind our two oceans to put our head in the sand. Even though a lot of us might say that's what we're doing yesterday or that's what we're doing today, right? I think a lot of uh, within this political debate, people will say we've done one or the other at times. But but the reality is, is that I think most Americans want us to be somewhere in the middle. So how do you think about what that middle is? Give us some concrete examples of what that looks like. I mean, and let's have this in practice, right? I mean, what does that tell us for, should we have gone into Iran? I, sorry, sorry, pardon me, Iraq. Uh, perhaps a Freudian slip. Um, should we have gone that, into that's, Iran? That's next year's podcast? Uh, what do you mean? Right, I don't know. Exactly, that's exactly. I'm a little ahead of time, I'm a little ahead of my time. Should we have gone into Iraq back in the day, right? Post 9-11, should we, what about Afghanistan? Should we still be in Afghanistan? Like, tell us some, some practical as applied uh, examples of what you're talking about. But 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 let's start first by saying about the policy. Like, what, talk to us about what it means in concrete terms to be somewhere between living at the at the tip of a bayonet and sticking your head in the sand like an ostrich. What's that middle ground look like? Well, just to take the example, for instance, of uh, what kind of engagements and involvement we need to be having with our allies and partners. We, you know, for, to begin with, we clearly do need allies and partners. Um, okay. This is not a world now, unfortunately. I mean, we are no longer standing astride the global arena in the way that we did at the end of the Cold War as the kind of you know, giant hyper power that, uh, you know, could persuade ourselves that it wasn't just nuts to, uh, you know, to, to think that we could sort of have our cake and eat it too and meet all right. challenges and uh, bear all burdens and whatever else. Uh, we don't have that luxury anymore. We okay. face considerable near peer challengers, two of them, not just one of them back as in back in the day. Uh, we face challenges from rogue regimes. The terrorist threat has not gone away. Right. Um, you know, plus the, all the normal messinesses of, of the world. So we clearly have to work with others in this. We can't just do entirely as we will. Sure. Um, and that means engaging with people who, building relationships with folks, maintaining relationships, not pissing away relationships with partners and friends who we need. Uh, so there's got to be a degree of engagement. But I think right. the... But also not kowtowing to them, right? Not just simply giving in to the... Precisely. The nature of the Europeans, right? So again, the, we have the principal conservative. Ground. Yeah, the principal conservative needs to, uh, you know, sort of always bear in mind that we need to work with others, and that entails that will necessarily entail a degree of compromise with them. It will entail a degree of, of of empathetic listening and generally making their concerns a factor in our own decision making. But it also means the the principal conservative bit of it means also remembering that the purpose of this is our security. Uh, you know, most fundamentally, and right. that that there is no, I mean, there's no intrinsic, from my perspective, there is no, in, this is going to sound harsh, but I don't mean it that way, there is no intrinsic benefit in engagement with international partners per se. I just don't 
care that much. If you embrace international partners because you think that there is something sort of transcendentally awesome about just being international and being cosmopolitan and a citizen of the world and so forth, you're having a different conversation than I am. The I'm, cocktail party sort of version of, of foreign policy. I am super happy having huge amounts of engagement. I mean, I'm a professional diplomat to some degree. That is incredibly important, but you have to always right. bear in mind that it serves a purpose and that purpose is our security. And, and for to the degree that and for so long as it serves our security, then I am all in. That means international institutions. It means international agreements. It means, you know, whatever else it may, it may mean. Uh, that's what, you know, that's the sort of the positive side of engagement. But when it doesn't serve that fundamental purpose, I'm perfectly comfortable walking away. I mean, arms control is a classic example of that. Um, yeah. I'm a pro arms control person, which seems funny sometimes by stereotype coming from the hawkish right. But, you know, and there are certainly those who are, I think, in principle against arms control, uh, or at least, you know, suspected for years that it's one of these uh, uncomfortable things that Lilliputians do to tie down the American Gulliver. You know, that's kind of a post-Cold War right-wing perspective, but that ain't the world we live in anymore. We yeah. need agreements and need engagement and need to find ways to reduce yeah. the risks and manage the challenges of strategic stability. And agreements have to be part of that. So I'm pro arms control, but not uncritically, not for its own sake. Right. The things that it can bring to ensuring that we are more secure and that sure. things don't escalate out of control and, you know, people in center sure. of the world, all that kind of good stuff. Right. So so it's 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 sort of bearing that kind of, um, you know, principled engagement means making sure that you keep your eye on the big picture and don't get carried away with the, you know, just the, the virtue posturing of, of uh, doing the, the fashionable thing with agreements. I don't, you know, agreements per se are worthless to me. What matters to me is what they enable you to do, what they help lock into place or at least make more likely in the arena. Um, and they're incredibly valuable as a tool, yeah. but they're just a tool to serve yeah. greater ends. Well, it reminds me of a story, you know, what you described reminds me of a story that, that I, I've been told. I don't know if the story is apocryphal or actually if it really, if it's really, if it really happened, but uh, it, the stories I heard, it was George Schultz, uh, Reagan's former uh, Secretary of State, uh, used to call in every ambassador that would uh, be headed out to their assignment. Um, and before they went for their assignment, and he would ask them, you know, at the end, after having a nice conversation with them about where they were going and what their plans were, um, he'd, he'd, he'd sort of point over to a large globe uh, that was in his office. Um, and, uh, and tell me, by the way, if you think, if, if, if I had the story wrong, if you had the story differently, or if it was a different person, but I heard it was Schultz, um, he would point to the globe and say uh, to this ambassador, you know, whether career or political, you know, come on over here, show me where your country is. And inevitably to a one that'd spin the globe and point to the country they were headed to. And he would say, no, no, no. And he'd spin the globe back around to the United States and point to, the, point to our nation and say, this is your country, right? Remember that, don't go <laughs> native when you get there. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like what you're describing is, is sort of, it seems obvious on its face, right? That, that our, our national interests are what should drive our alliances, what's in America's interest, um, you know, should drive those things, not just some fetishism of, of international, you know, cocktail parties and the like, but, but so let's say we all agree on that, right? So we all agree that uh, we shouldn't be ostriches. We shouldn't be, you know, uh, you know, Julius Caesar or, or Genghis Khan, right? You know, uh, with the, with the, uh, with the, um, with, with the, with the bayonet drawn constantly, right? Uh, we shouldn't be uh, in alliances just for the sake of going to cocktail parties. We should do them for American national interest. But what is that? That seems, it seems obvious, right? I mean, maybe it's not obvious. Maybe in the current environment, it's not obvious, right? And maybe it's worth saying, but what does that mean in practice, right? So Chris, I mean, you know, you just, you just came out of serving in, in, the, in, in the Trump administration. You've served previously, uh, I believe in the Bush administration, you served on Capitol Hill, um, including as chief counsel of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You know, you, you've, in your job, you've dealt with a lot of very practical realities and applying sort of uh, uh, this philosophy uh, to practical reality. Talk about what that means in practice. Like what is, what, this all makes sense, but how does it play out? How is it different than what other people say we should be doing? Well, I mean, just to, if, since we were on arms control a moment ago, why not stay there for a moment longer? Yeah, sure. um, I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, was enormously controversial uh, in terms of how the Trump administration, which I recently served, approached arms control is, is and the Bush administration before it, I suppose, is our willingness to walk away from uh, international treaties when we decided that they were no longer ones that met our interests. I mean, go back to 2002, for instance, the, uh, yeah. you know, we, we spent the years- ABM. Of the yeah, we spent the, the years of the Clinton administration negotiating, you know, around the edges of, of you know, sort of protocol understandings in that context about what you could or couldn't do. Uh, but it became increasingly clear that we felt for reasons that had nothing to do with the Russians, um, yeah. but we felt that it was necessary to, to have more of an anti-ballistic missile 
defense architecture than the treaty would frankly allow. Right. Um, this was because of uh, principally North Korea, but you know, emerging concerns about Iran, Iran, and, uh, right. missile proliferation. You know, the, um, so so when it became clear that that what we felt we needed for our security wasn't compatible with the treaty, we walked away from the Locked treaty. It out. Yeah. We, and we did so through its withdrawal procedures quite lawfully, right? Yes. What we did not do is do what the Russians decided to do with INF. And that is to say like, oh, well, this is awkward. We don't like it anymore. We'll just others, violate it. We'll just violate it and pretend we're not. Right. And, you know, and, uh, right, and lie about it <laughs> and over and over again. Shamelessly, right? Shamelessly. And rely upon wait, our own wait, unwillingness it sounds, to- right? It right? sounds I mean, like Russian Olympic behavior. Well, we'll just shocking. cheat and lie about it repeatedly. Shocking that there's a pattern Olympic there. Committee. Right, exactly. Keep so, going, sorry. No, so, so, I mean, it's the willingness to walk away when it doesn't serve your interest anymore, but that's not the same thing. And it's, of course, crudely stereotyped and feeds into, you know, all sorts of people's propaganda against us that we are, you know, against arms control. Like, well, good Lord, no, we're, we, we, I think, I would almost say that, that the approach that we took is, is almost more faithful truly to arms control than just the kind of reflexive, we want an agreement for the sake of having an agreement and we'll stick to it no matter what, because it's just so unthinkable to us to walk away from an agreement, no matter what its security implications. That's not really being faithful to arms control. Um, that's fetishizing agreements without content. Um, I, I've used this before and perhaps I've overused it, but you know, there's a, I think there's a phrase from, maybe from Plutarch about, you know, the true friend is, is not a flatterer. Um, mm. If I'm really a friend of arms control, I, I think I have an obligation to support it and defend it and engage in it everywhere it serves its purpose and to defend it vehemently as needs be. Uh, right. But when it doesn't serve its purpose, it's not being a friend of arms control to cling to agreements just because they're agreements. That's actually to betray the concept because what these are supposed hmm. to do is support security interests and to make the world more secure and your country more secure and to prevent horrible things from happening. And if you just end them because yeah. it's cool to be in them and you're afraid of the optics of leaving them, irrespective of what the security impact is, is of that posture, you're, you're betraying arms control. You're not That's them. interesting because I do think there's a lot of people and I think probably, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, you know, Americans out there who would say, look, I, look, we may need to walk away from arms control agreements, right? Or, or proliferation agreements or the like, but, um, but I think their general assumption is that these are good things and that when we agree to constrain ourselves and the enemy agrees to constrain themselves, the adversaries, um, that's a that's a good thing. It creates peace and stability. But as you're describing it, there may be circumstances under which it's not a good thing. Um, and and ha just arms control for the sake of arms control may not be the right approach. And that we need to sort of retrain ourselves to think about, OK, what's in our interests? Right. And what agreements can we make that are consistent with those interests, including the interest in peace and stability? Am I hearing you right when you say that? Oh, I think that, I think that's quite right. I mean, and historically, one can see echoes of this uh, all over the place. I mean, I, I, we mentioned INF relatively recently, but you yeah. know, we we were scrupulously abiding by the INF treaty for you know for, for years and years. Um, and, and that's and by the way the the intermediate range nuclear forces treaty. Is that quite right? correct? INF. Sorry for not yeah. being not being clear for your listeners. Um, it was a, a agreement. It was actually the first agreement this first strategic, or the first arms control agreement to entirely prohibit an entire class of delivery system. It got rid of intermediate range missiles uh, after a very tense period in which the Soviets during the late 1970s had deployed a bunch of these range missiles against uh, our allies and US forces in Europe. Um, NATO did a countervailing deployment after a while. I was Turkey. Uh, with lots of painful, uh, you know, painful politics of it, but we deployed ground launch cruise missiles and Pershing two missiles in Europe as a as a counterpoise to yeah. the to the Soviet deployments. And like, oh, all of a sudden they decided it was worth negotiating, and we got an agreement in 1987, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev to um, to to make the entire category of these things go away. And, right. and that was, you know, at the time that was very much in our interest, and we were very scrupulous about adhering to it the whole yeah. the whole while. The Russians had a different approach when they decided that they wanted to have some of these tools. Again, they simply started building them. Um, in effect, relying upon, well, in a sense, relying upon our not being what I would describe as true friends of arms control. They assumed, and indeed got away with it for a while, they assumed that we would be so afraid politically of ditching an arms control agreement that yeah. we would simply allow them to keep deploying these things quietly, sort of surreptitiously in violation mm -hmm. of the treaty. And we did for a while. And for, for a while, while indeed. For, right, the prior, you know, two administrations ago knew about this and we didn't call it out. We had sort of quietly talked to the Russians. Part of it was a question about intelligence sources and methods and whether we would reveal how we knew that they were violating the treaty. But ultimately, 
Uh, we came out and told them, right, that we knew they were in violation. Um, and made, uh, made and a formal still, finding, yeah. Right, and, and, and they still, you know, refuse to abide. Um, and so, so what happens next? Why couldn't we just sort of, I mean, presumably these treaties and these agreements have, have mechanisms to hold them account. Why not hold them to account? Why, why opt out of the treaty? I well, we did, away from it. we did try to hold them to account. I mean, there was a, you know, you can imagine there being sort of an escalation ladder here. I mean, it starts with the finger wag, uh, you know, hey, you're doing something that is, we don't think is right. Um, there were an enormous number of diplomatic engagements. I've forgotten the number. I think it may have been as many as 30 different separate engagements between U.S. officials and their Russian counterparts in various fora over this under the Obama right. administration and the Trump administration. Um, there, uh, There is a commission that well, was a commission that was set up under the treaty to, to deal with compliance questions. That was convened at one point, um, you know, and all these things, unfortunately, were unavailing. Though in 2017, yeah. we decided that it was time to to move from the, you know, the stereotypical British Bobby, you know, stop or I'll say stop again, uh, as the joke used to be. That's not true anymore. They're actually, they carry a lot of firearms there now. They're just, they're just, yeah. the, world, the world is a different place, but, uh, um, but, you know, we were doing the stereotypical Bobby of, uh, Telling them it will be you know, extra cross if they don't stop doing the bad things they're doing. Yeah, uh, that worked. You know, that, that's where you start. That's fair. That's how dip diplomacy usually works. That's okay. fine. But but what do you do when that doesn't work? And what we decided in seventeen was that it was time to 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 begin to put some some concrete pressure on them. And what um, principals decided uh, in the summer of seventeen was that they were going to authorize the Pentagon to begin, you know, sort of basic research and development on our own INF class systems now it was, so one that would violate the treaty if, well if if, if we kept i mean there are there are things that you could do under the treaty in like really basic r d up right. to the point of things like flight testing or whatever else it was okay. and if you cross over into flight testing for instance and certainly into manufacturer right. deployment all but all that that's clearly a violation but there were some right. very elementary steps of preparatory steps that you could take okay. entirely within the treaty and Pentagon was right. authorized to start doing that as okay. a way to send the signal to the Russians that, hey, guys, look, this isn't just finger wagging territory. We really right. mean this. Our patience is not infinite. Yep. And, you know, if at some point you decide that that you're still not going to change course, yep. you need to understand that the status quo is no longer an available yep. option for you. They so liked it that we were, yeah. you know, tolerating their violations and not doing anything ourselves. Right. But we wanted to signal that, by the way, that that option is going to be taken off the table at some point. So they got to comply. You got to see us play the game, too. Right. So, um uh, well, I mean, ultimately, the decision was was made as the Russians continued to move forward without any change, uh, and indeed without admitting. Now, we did get them to admit that there was such a missile, but right. they but not that it violated the treaty. Right. Quite correct. They denied its capability, which we right? knew it did. We've been seeing this all along. Yes. Right. Um, so you know, they went from you know flight testing to to you know initial operational capability yeah. to actual deployment of multiple battalions and by the yeah. time you got to things driving around in the field out there um you know president trump i think quite recently said okay we're done this is just not a tenable situation where they are actually deploying these damn things yeah. and we are still remaining scrupulously within treaty so 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 let's take it back to our to our main topic this idea of principled conservative national security foreign policy so what so in in the thing you just described right so you described sort of you know, us learning about this, about sort of arms control for arms control sake versus arms control for America's interests. Then the situation we learn about the Russians and we fast forward to Trump walks away from the treaty, right? Explain to the, our audience sort of where principled conservative foreign policy played in there, uh, in your view, where it went right, where it went wrong, and, and what you might have done either the same or differently if you were applying this principled conservative foreign policy view to the world um, in this scenario here you just described for us. I mean, if I had a magic wand myself, I, yeah. I would have maybe put another another link in the chain. Um, okay. I mean, if you think of the escalation ladder, now at some point, you know, you can't keep trying to put infinite numbers of links in the chain because these things really are being deployed. But um, right. you know, there were there was an available option, and and we did talk about this when I was on the Hill at some point, mm -hmm. uh, uh, working at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, a committee with which you'll have a lot of familiarity, um, being my actually my predecessor there, if I recall. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there was an option of uh, declaring a material breach under the Vienna mm -hmm. Convention on the Law and Treaties and okay. suspending obligations without necessarily withdrawing. The, the, the international legal framework allows you sort of a halfway house of, you know, a, of, a, of a stronger commitment signal of right. taking it really seriously, but, but stopping short of, of actually withdrawing it away. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we could have done that. Uh, I don't think it could have, you know, 
I, it, there's no sign it would have made any difference in fairness. So I, I think the Russians were going to do what the Russians were going to do. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, it may be that we end up in a place where we now have the ability. Well, there was never a question, let me just say for the record, of yeah. the United States pursuing nuclear armed uh, mm -hmm. intermediate range systems. I don't think I've heard no one articulate a desire or a need for that. Um, and of course, given their ranges, I, you know, you would have to have someplace to put them. And our allies are not remotely interested in having that. However, right. what we were talking about was building conventionally armed tools um, mm -hmm. of the sort that the Chinese have gazillions, to use the technical yeah. term, uh, and the Russians have an increasingly large number, although they actually put nukes on them. But um, yeah. So, so there were, you know, there was concrete, there, there is concrete utility as, as many observers have noted in, in us beginning to develop these tools, especially for a sort of uh, Indo-Pacific scenario in the conventionally armed department. Yeah. Um, you know, and at some point you, you need to get about business if it's clear that the Russians are not gonna change course. Um, yeah. I think it would have been, the diplomacy would have been slightly easier with our allies had we, you know, had another link in that chain. Um, okay. You need to bring people along with that. Yeah. But you know, at the end of the day, it is fundamentally a security question. And if the treaty is not doing its job of reining in threats to the United States, which it wasn't, then you really have no option but to walk away. Yeah. And, and the question is how you manage the tactics of getting to that point. And you know, people disagree about you know some of those details. But I think fundamentally, I can't see. And every time I've, I used to have arguments with folks about this, it would be. You know, say, oh, how can you guys be considering getting out of the treaty? I said, well, tell us what the alternative is. What is it that is going to get the Russians to stop deploying these systems that are in fact violations of the treaty? What's your right. plan? Please, I'm all ears. Give me your plan for how you're going to turn right. this around and tell me how right. it's different from what we've already tried. And no one ever had anything intelligent yeah. to say there. So there, at the end of the day, it was it turned into basically an exhaustion of, of, of alternatives situation. Right. Um, and I, we probably could have been clearer perhaps about spelling that out but uh, but i think fundamentally there really wasn't any question about what needed to be done i think that makes sense so you know we've got about 10 minutes remaining in our podcast and i want to talk to you about um sort of what you describe in your paper as the central competitive challenge of our era right uh the rise of china um and, and as you point out you know it, it's not the it's not the country we expected it to be it's not the sort of liberalizing power with democracy afoot. Um, in, in fact, to the contrary, it's going the opposite direction, increasingly becoming more authoritarian, uh, using advanced technology to uh, to repress its own people um, and to advance its agenda around the globe where it's not actually uh, benefiting the nations with, with, with whom it's it's working, but rather simply uh, taking and, and, and bringing back home. So so China's this 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 threat, uh, you know, I think as, as you and I both share uh, the view, and I think increasingly on a bipartisan basis, we're seeing a shared view that uh, China's a threat, particularly in the post-COVID environment. Talk to us about, in your mind, what a principled conservative foreign policy, national security policy is towards China, and how does it differ from what uh, the Trump administration did, um, and how's it, if, if at all, and how does it differ from what the Biden administration is doing, uh, if at all? Well, I, I think if, if, to the degree that that, that we got some of the answers wrong in the Trump administration. It was with the, the, the sort of the tone and flavor of, uh, uh, of some of how we approached this. We gave the impression, okay. not just to, to Beijing, which mm -hmm. in some respects is less important, but it's important, uh, but also to some of those with whom we need to work in countering uh, China's sort of revisionist geopolitical strategy. We gave the impression to some of them that we were you know, really sort of reflexively anti-Chinese in the sense that it's mm -hmm. almost played into Chinese propaganda narratives. And we didn't have to be quite so shrill about it, but, but fundamentally the, the, the approach that we took was, was sound and the Biden administration has picked up that baton um, in ways that I didn't fully expect. I mean, if you had asked me, good Lord, you know, back in the mid aughts, when I first started to, to work on China issues and write on them as a think tanker, for instance, mm -hmm. um, uh, if you had asked me what it would take to turn the US government seriously into the business of competitive strategy vis-a-vis -vis Beijing, which I've felt we've needed for a long time. Um, yeah. I would have described it as a years long effort of trying to, you know, just st keep keep the, sh the, the nose to the grindstone to sort of slowly, slowly, slowly nudge the super tanker onto a different, different uh, bearing, uh, except mm -hmm. that this super tanker did a a bootlegger turn. I mean, it was, uh, we we are in a radically different place uh, than than under the Obama administration, or at least early Obama administration. And they they began okay. it, uh, they began it with the you know so called pivot or rebalance, um, right? But but the U.S. policy community has done a remarkable 
change, of course, when it comes to suddenly waking up to the challenges of great power competition with China. Right. Now, I think it's lamentably late. We should have been doing this a long time Fair before. Enough. And we squandered a generation which they were right. posturing against us. And Fair. we were still imagining that we could make, you know, happy liberal Democrats right. out of uh, out of them through through engagement and, and assisting their relatives. But it didn't work. But we did. It didn't work. Right. That I mean, didn't work. And it is right. now time to change course. And, and I think right. oh, it's been a remarkable degree to which both sides of the aisle have have recognized yes. that. Now, there will, of course, be differences in tone and flavor between our parties, just as there always were in dealing with the Soviets. But, but right. there, there is a remarkable degree of consensus upon the fact that we are at least now in a competitive strategy game. And even right. admitting that is half the... I used to say back when I first started on these issues that what we needed to be is, you know, was, I imagine it like, this is not terribly politically correct, but almost like sort of a 12-step program. Hi, I'm Chris, and I have no <laughs> geopolitical strategy, but know that I need one. And right. everyone else around the geopolitical table claps appreciatively. And knowing that you need one isn't the same thing as having one. So we, we right. hadn't figured that out yet for a long okay. time. But at least we began to recognize that, oh, crap, we're in a situation where this isn't yeah. incredibly important. Now we're further along that curve, and we're starting to build one, and we're starting to see a lot of continuity on this. And if I were in Beijing, in the leadership compound of the Chinese Communist Party, I would be very disheartened by yeah. the I would have desperately hoped that, you know, I would have been telling myself that the Trump administration people were sort of, I don't know, listen to their crazy, and there's crazy racists and, and this right. will pass and we'll get back to sort of a, you know, don't worry, business friendly, we'll just sell out the stuff to try right. to make a bunch of money and not really care what happens and, and maybe delude ourselves that engagement's going to work. Um, it'll get back to that. Don't worry. It'll be okay, sir. Um, right. And yet it hasn't. And I think the idea that, uh, uh, that, that both sides of the aisle have have really focused upon this is a really powerful one in multiple ways. It is a powerful one in the sense of the signal it sends to Beijing that, oh, by the way, you, what you got used to um, in us you know, facilitating you doing all these things that it turns out you're now doing, you know, those days are over. Um, it mm -hmm. sends a strong message to allies and partners because uh, you know, it tells them that we are really genuinely in this for the long haul. There will be stability and consistency in our approach to great power competitive behavior. Um, that's important to know because you know no one wants to, uh, you know, no one wants to to posture against the rising you know regional hegemon in Asia if you think your friends and partners in that competitive posture are going to walk away from you right. in four years' time. Right, right? of course. It is incredibly important to send a signal that, oh, by the way, this is the new normal, where we're going to take this stuff really seriously as a country, and we're going to work over the long term with our friends and partners uh, to, to, you know, to, to not allow the international community to be, to be bullied or, or reshaped in the ways that it has been very clearly the Chinese Communist Party's objective for a long time to do. So, so that's, a huge, that's a huge thing. And uh, you know, that staying power that I think mm -hmm. a, you know, a political consensus on the, the, there being a China challenge, there will always be tactical disagreements, but right. the staying power of the agreement upon that as the game that we are unfortunately now in against our will, but very unavoidably nonetheless, that's right. a huge thing. And that, that's enormous progress that I'm delighted to see that one of the few things that we actually agree upon across the aisle yeah. in this country. Um, and we should be looking for more opportunities like that. I think the Biden administration would like to make climate issues uh, an issue of that mm -hmm. sort, um, where they can, you know, they may be the the driver of the change, just as the Trump administration was the, you know, the people who I think really flipped the narrative on China policy in an emphatic yeah. way. Um, but I think the Biden folks would love to do that for climate policy too. It may be that we can accumulate at least a few of these agenda pieces um, yeah. moving forward in ways that'll that'll allow us to to vindicate our interests much more effectively and to get beyond all yeah. this ugly internecine squabbling and look beyond our domestic political noses to the bigger picture. Well, since you raised it, let's talk about that. What is, in your mind, what does a principled conservative approach to climate change look like? Is there one? Because, you know, there are a lot of conservatives who uh, who sort of, you know, question the science on climate change. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> kind of like uh, some conservatives on, on COVID, uh, question science and the like. Uh, talk to us about whether... Um, uh, whether there is a, a principled conservative foreign policy on, on climate change and what that looks like. Well, I, I mean, I, I am not enough of an expert on climate to say a lot of really intelligent things here, to be, let's yeah. be fair. However, my instinct is that, yes, there is. Uh, first okay. of all, denying what seems, well, when one hears people denying 
anthropogenic climate change now, you usually hear it sort of in the tone of voice that you know the, the degree of sort of emphasis and and uh, vehemence that is usually reserved for people insisting upon things that are obviously not true. Uh, okay. This, uh, you can't really deny the science. The question is, what do we do about it? And I think okay. there is a huge right. difference in terms of what a principled conservative um, should be, at least their, their instinct should be to try to do. And I, I view, yeah. you know, if there, for instance, are uh, are unpriced externalities in market behavior in Western economies and indeed all economies. That's a, you know, trying to, to address that as a problem of making the market work better and setting yeah. up mechanisms that would allow market driven choices to find the optimal allocation of carbon intensivity in, in industry and economic behavior, for example. Uh, so that is so, so much more of a trade. So cap or, and trade, or, or or some kind of carbon pricing that would allow economic okay. decision makers. Okay. You know, we shouldn't. You know, I think we're we should be Hayekian enough to to think it re freaking ridiculous to imagine that a government bureaucrat can can pick winners in any fine grained way in the economy and can you know right. central planning cannot be the reflex we have here. Um, yeah. We can't, and we need to resist the urge in some quarters of you know there are certainly those who would like to use climate change as an uh, an excuse or, or a uh, you know an opportunity to dismantle the, the yeah. economy of, of post-industrial capitalism um, you know we, we, the principal conservative resists all of that because yeah. that's you know you, you're slipping into cures worse than disease there because it's not yeah. going to work therefore it will not help the climate problem and it will create a whole host of externalities in terms of you know overreaching mess of, of bureaucratization and, yeah. and overreach to government, right? So a principal conservative looks for ways to involve market mechanism, whether it's price, carbon pricing of some sort or perhaps right. cap and trade, which is a variation on that theme. You know, I'm not the expert on, on what those details look like, but I think a principal conservative would look for ways to address the problem that are as faithful as possible to the yeah. market mechanisms that we have learned to understand and to trust and to, well, frankly, to justifiably have a lot more faith in than uh, yeah. all, you know, giving world historical, all encompassing power to a, you know, to this or that government yeah. bureaucracy. That's where conservatives can sort of, you know, draw the line and say, no, not that, but let's have a constructive way to approach the problem. Yeah. At least that's where my instinct goes. Well, so, so let me ask you one, one last question to sort of wrap us up. Um, you know, as we're thinking about uh, these questions about what a, you know, what a principled conservative foreign policy might look like, or what a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a principle, you know, liberal foreign policy might look like, you know, one of the things we started with was this conversation about, um, about your paper, um, and this paper that that Jake Sullivan and a number of other sort of folks in the now in the Biden administration or associated with the Biden administration wrote about making making foreign policy work for the middle class. What's your view about whether we can, quote, unquote, make foreign policy work for the middle class, what that would look like, and is there a relation between that and this idea of principled conservative foreign policy, or are they just fundamentally different things? Well, I mean, my instinct is to be a bit reluctant of any kind of an assumption that it can or should be the objective of foreign and national security policy to, to support any one sub-component of the United States or of the American people or the other. I, mm -hmm. I, I, one of the, I mean, there are huge challenges uh, that we face in the Republican Party in terms of what we think about you know, our whole range of domestic issues, um, how we relate to the other side of the aisle. Um, that's not really where my professional background has been. And I, I think I, I should be I should be very cautious about weighing in sure. on those things. Um, but when it comes to foreign policy, one of the things about that is that you don't actually I don't think you have to think of it in terms of which piece of America are you serving impliedly at the expense of the others. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think foreign policy and, and, and national security policy uh, are things that can be you know, arrogated to one group or another. The, the beauty of them is that they actually are, we have a collective interest, all Americans as such, and however we decide our domestic policies should be. Um, we have a powerful interest in making sure that we retain the ability to make those choices as a free right. and independent sovereign people with a, a rule of law, democracy that allows us to choose our leaders, to hold them accountable, to change course if we don't like what they're doing. You know, that's a, you know, that is what the foreign policy and national security apparatus at the most fundamental is designed to preserve. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't have to pick sides in terms of, is it you know, the for or against the middle class. I don't even know how to have that conversation about foreign policy yeah. because its whole point is to allow us to make those decisions for ourselves as a sovereign people. 
Well, that seems like a great place to wrap up. Uh, Dr. Chris Ford, thanks so much for joining us today. What a great conversation about your paper uh, that you published for the National Security Institute, Principle to Conservatism in America's Foreign Policy and National Security. You can find that on our website, along with a lot of other papers by the National Security Institute at nationalsecurity.gmu.edu. And that's a wrap. As always, Fault Lines is produced by the National Security Institute. Find out more about the Institute and upcoming events at that same website I just gave you, nationalsecurity.gmu.edu. If you have any topics you'd like us to cover in the future, send us an email at nsi at gmu.edu. You can also tweet us at Mason Natsek. If you like what we're doing here, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe so that more people can find our show. We'd like to thank Claude Jennings for editing, Riley Boyd for research assistance, and Maeve Cronin for production assistance. Join us next week for another provocative conversation and further analysis of national security's fault lines.